Hello friends, this is Promi, and this is a very exciting week because Kerbal Space Program 1.0 has been released. Yes, Kerbal Space Program is finally out of early access. It's been a little over three years in development, and uh, I have been playing since 0.13 thereabouts, um, so this has been a long time coming. So let's go over some of the changes in this version. First thing you'll notice is that on upon loading the game, it loads much faster than previously, uh, up to three times faster. This is because all textures have been converted to DDS format, and this means they don't have to be compressed every single time the game loads. Here we can see Valentina Kerman on the menu screen. She's using the new female Kerbal model. I'm pretty happy with how the female models have turned out. I think the uh, the little bit of eye makeup they had on they have on was kind of unnecessary, but I can always change that with texture replacer if I want to. The squad says that there are up to 10,000 female names that can come out of their name generator, um, and if you have any Kerbals from past saves that you have considered to be female, um, you can easily change their sex in the config file, unlike the um, engineer, pilot, and scientist specializations introduced in a prior version that seem tied to the name generator itself. Also of note, Elon Kerman has been added to the name pool, so he will show up from time to time. Let's take a look at the new settings. First thing you'll see here is that the UI can now be made semi-transparent. I have it set at 25% here for demonstration purposes. I find that anything above 50% is not so noticeable. I probably won't leave uh, the UI this transparent for um, my career playthrough with the Kerbal Commonwealth Space Program, but uh, for, for this video I'll leave it as it is. You also see here that you can change camera wobble. This is sort of similar to the mod Curbquake. Um, it's not quite as shaky and more wobbly as the name uh, implies. There's separate sliders for external and internal views. I currently have my external views set to zero because I don't really want my outside camera shaking around, but it's kind of a nice feature to have for the IVAs in my opinion. So let's move over to the input section here. The joystick axes can now be set independently for staging, docking, translation, and docking rotation. So you have a little more control over exactly what your joystick axes are doing. And if we move over to the other section here, you'll see that uh, KSP now supports head tracking through track IR and you can activate it independently for all these different situations. Supposedly free track uh, also works. Unfortunately I do not have any head tracking hardware so this is not something that I will be able to demonstrate today. Okay let's uh, look at the new difficulty settings. Oh, Before I do that, if you look here you can see that uh, on the Continue Saved Game dialog box, um, Career Games now show your fun, science, and reputation, and number of contracts on the uh, Load dialog. So that's nice. But if we go to start a new career under Difficulty Options, we now have Re-Entry Heating and Resource Abundance. These uh, are tied to two of the new systems I will talk about later. Uh, Re-entry heating can be turned completely off if desired. It can also be turned up to 120% for extra challenge. Resource abundance controls the abundance of the ore resource, which is mineable on various celestial bodies. Um, interestingly, it also will uh, control the abundance of any mods that hook into the stock resource system. An example of this is Rover Dude's Carbonite mod, which now uses the stock resource system 
So this slider will control the amount of carbonite in the game as well. One more thing on the main screen here is that we have a number of new tutorials. Uh, docking is new, Science Basics, and there's a Return from the Moon as well, or Mune, I should say. All the other tutorials that are existing uh, have been completely updated, so they are relevant to this version. The tech tree has changed quite a bit in career mode. Uh, you can see the entire thing from the beginning right now, so that makes it easier to plan out your progression. It's especially important for new players who aren't so familiar with the tech tree. Um, the parts and technologies have all been rearranged. There's new nodes as well. You can see our starting parts here are somewhat different. We have our Mark 1 command pod. Uh, the new smaller mystery goo container. It's actually not, the part's not new, it's just been shrunk down. Uh, girder segment, parachute, and this new flea, RT5 flea solid rocket booster, which is another 1.25 meter booster, but it's a little stubby thing that's smaller than the RT10. Also, the tech tree is now defined in a config file which makes it much easier to change uh, without the need for a mod. Also, the uh, game will now load in custom icons for the nodes if they're placed in the proper directory. So this should, be, should make creating custom trees um, a lot easier. Over to look at contracts now, we have three new types, and uh, an existing type has been changed somewhat. So I've got these active here. Firstly, the um, rescue contract now has been reclassified as a recovery contract, which includes Kerbals as well as ships and parts. So in this particular one, we have a Kerbal and also his shipwreck which is stranded in orbit around Drez. The shipwreck mass is 3.5 tons, and the contract is for bringing both the wreck and the Kerbal back to Kerbin. So onto the brand new contract types. We have the ore extraction contracts to go with our new resource system. So in this one, it's asking us to, requ to acquire 3,000 units of ore from Minmus and return it to Kerbin. Not all of them will require you to return the ore. The more basic ones only require you to obtain it. Then there's the tourism contracts. There's now um, space tourism and the tourists will appear in your astronaut complex once the contract is accepted. They cannot actually do anything. They can't pilot vessels, they can't go on EVA, and they don't have any skills. Um, they're just basically cargo to take to their destination. This particular contract is a quite high-end one. Each, uh, it's got five different tourists. They all want to go to different places some suborbital, some orbital, flybys. This guy wants to go on a suborbital flight on the sun, so good luck with that. Lastly, we have the Grand Tour contract. This one requires you do a flyby of Moho, Tylo, and Drez using a single vessel. If we just quickly hop over to the astronaut complex, you can see we have the tourists from that tourism contract. And also of note here is that hiring additional crew now costs money. And with each crew you hire, that price goes up. So it can be quite pricey to fill up your roster. 
back to Mission Control in a fresh new save for one more thing before we continue. Um, you'll notice that we don't have altitude records here. We just have our Escape the Atmosphere and Orbit Kerbin. Um, that's because the old uh, altitude record contracts, as well as new ones for distance and speed, are now always active, and when you complete one, you will automatically get the next one. This prevents situations that used to occur where if you went very high in your first or second flight, you would miss out on a lot of money because you wouldn't be able to get those um, intermediate altitude records. Now this remedies that situation by giving them all to you automatically. And these, uh, this automatic system extends to all the world first contracts, extending all the way out to Elu. Now let's look at the new parts. First you'll notice on the load dialog in the VAB and spaceplane hangar, we now have a nice little thumbnail of our crafts. Going to look at the new arrow parts first. Also you'll notice that loaded a lot faster than it would have in previous versions. Uh, this is because they have fixed it so it no longer needs to reload the entire scene when you load a new craft. You can also take a craft and merge it into your current scene so that you can load a, a craft without deleting what you have here already. So let's look at these new arrow parts. First of all, these two at the top, which you may not recognize, are actually the existing canards. We have our advanced canard and our standard canard. They've been remodeled and retextured. The advanced one no longer has the forward sweep. Um, and I kind of prefer it this way, but some people might have liked the, the forward swept wing. Um, next here we have the engine nacelle and this engine pre-cooler. They're both basically intakes plus uh, fuel tanks. So we got 40 units of liquid fuel in each of them. Here we have uh, new space plane wings. So these are the big S parts. And they are sort of shuttle style. We have this big S delta wing. You'll notice it's a wet wing. It actually can hold fuel. Um, same with the big S wing strake. Will also hold fuel. Uh, the tail fin does not, but it does have a built-in control surface. We also have these big S elevons. One and two. Which are essentially just larger versions of the existing ones. Next we have these FAT455 parts and that has the aeroplane main wing, again another wet wing. It's got a control surface so it matches. Um, another tail fin with built-in control surface. This is the one of the old swept wings that's been remodeled. Uh, similarly, the old tail fin. Over here, we have a retextured and remodeled uh, tail connector. And there's also a second tail connector now that has uh, a flat edge on one side. So if you want to get that sort of World War II fighter look, you don't have to fiddle with the tail connector any longer. You can just use this one. So up here, you can see we have two new nose cones. One that's uh, sort of standard and one that's tilted. This one again can be used as a short tail connector or if you want to have an Ariane 5 or Soyuz look to your rockets, these would be quite nice for your add-on boosters. Here we have our uh, remodeled and textured Mark 1 inline cockpit. It uh, matches the new art style a little better. And these two intakes are also actually existing ones that have been remodeled. 
you have your circular intake and your ram air intake. One more thing at the bottom here, we have what used to be the avionics nose cone is now the fly by wire avionics hub. And what this part will do is give you SAS on craft that otherwise would not have it. It's not a probe core, but if you have a vehicle that's only crewed by engineers and scientists, this will allow them to use stability assist. Okay, uh, oh, one more thing. We have our air brake. This is a new part. You can actually set it to be um, activated by pitch and yaw controls, like a control surface. Um, and if we deploy it here, you can see it uh, pops right up, sort of reminiscent of the large brake on the back of uh, the SU-27. Regular control surfaces can also be used as flaps. Uh, so if we set that to oops, set that to deploy, it'll stay like that. And you can also have it inverted in case you have it on upside down, or if you want to use it as a spoiler instead of a flap. And uh, these were not here before. These let you, um, if you are familiar with Ferrum Aerospace Research, these are probably familiar. They let you restrict the control surface to only being active on certain inputs. Okay, let's take a look at some different parts. Let's take a look at fairings. So, Kerbal Space Program 1.0 has these new uh, procedural fairings. Uh, you can see if you mouse over, they fly apart and let you access the parts inside. Comes in three sizes. You want to put your decouplers above the fairing base, um, otherwise, the fairing base will be stuck on your payload. Let's just draw this again so we can see how it goes. So you just move the mouse and then you click for each section you want to draw. Right clicking will reset the, the tool and then once it's close enough you can close it up right like that. They do tend to be in many many pieces and explode kind of like confetti. Uh, a lot of people are not huge fans of that. Um, and certainly if you want your fairings to split in half, you're best off sticking with something like uh, procedural fairings or KW rocketry. Uh, but this is certainly a welcome addition to, to the sock game. This is another new thing, is that when you've changed something and haven't saved, there's actually a, a dialogue. Uh, confirmation box rather. There is also a confirmation box if you are saving over an existing craft. Um, so this can prevent a lot of uh, accidents that could have happened in the past. But we're not going to save our changes here. Let's load this one. You can see we have a number of new landing gears. We've got our medium gear here and a large gear. And on the end here, we have some static gears. They're sort of shrouded. Mm, very reminiscent of 1930s aircraft. And this tail and or nose wheel here uh, is actually steerable. And you can lock that steering if you want. Also on this truss here, I've included another new part, which is a new parachute they've added. This is a radial drogue chute. It uses the same model as the standard radial chute, but it's quite a bit smaller and it's obviously orange. Here we have heat shields to deal with the new 
re-entry effects. Comes in three sizes. Uh, a neat effect is that as the uh, ablator resource depletes, uh, the heat shields will actually fade to black. Right now there's a bit of an issue with the heat shields in that although they do have mass, they don't actually have a mass uh, the mass on the center of the part. Instead, it adds the mass to the uh, the root part. So people are finding that with um, with the capsule by itself, it will orient itself properly on re-entry, of course, and then it would burn up. But with the heat shield added, it's somewhat unstable and likes to tilt into the airstream. Um, and this is causing some issues, but there are already module manager scripts out there, or you can just um, edit the physics significance on the part uh, in the can in their config file, uh, and that will that is a way to get around that issue at the moment. Squad is working on a 1.0.1 patch right now. Um, as of this recording, we don't know what is in it. But uh, there's a good possibility that they will be fixing this heat shield issue. Okay, lastly we have a bunch of new utility parts. Utility and science. And uh, the new resource parts. So the new resource is just ore, as I've mentioned before. We have our uh, two ore tanks at 1.25 and 2.5 meters. We have our converter here, which will convert ore into liquid fuel, oxidizer, or monopropellant. And the bottom here, we have our drills for extracting the ore from planets, moons, or asteroids. At the top here, we have uh, these new service bays. give you a, a nice little place to put batteries or science equipment or what have you. Um, keeps them out of the airstream, keeps your craft aerodynamic, also protects them from re-entry heating. Uh, right now I have a, the new fuel cell parts in here. There's a small one and a big one that's a, a bank of six. These will convert um, fuel and oxidizer into electricity. Uh, again, we have our smaller mystery goo container. This is a new part that uh, places the avionics nose cone since that has been repurposed as an SAS device. So if we look here, it is called the Atmospheric Fluid Spectrovariometer. Next we have uh, these scanning parts, another part of the resource system. This is our survey scanner. And with this you basically want to put it into a polar orbit and it will give you a rough overview of the resources uh, on that planetary body. To get a finer picture you can use this, which is the narrowband scanner. That's another thing you can use from orbit. And on the surface, you can use this uh, small scanning module. And it will tell you your latitude, longitude, uh, what biome you're in, as well as the resource concentration on that spot. Here we can see the new IVA for the Mark III passenger cabin. Um, all the crude parts now have proper IVAs. So here's our Mark III cabin. Here is our Mark I inline cockpit. This one has really good visibility now. Uh, so I think this will probably be a favorite of people who like flying from IVA. Here we have our Mark II passenger cabin. Uh, 
here's the mark three um, command cockpit or flight deck whatever it is called it's very reminiscent of the space shuttle old four kerbals lots of displays in here so it'll be interesting to see how many they actually put in here with the raster prop monitor mod and finally we have the uh, mobile science lab so you can see we got our uh, little science experiments going on in there um, cubbies for experiments snacks what have you bio storage sounds rather ominous we got some notes here pick up Jeb avoid Kraken milk eggs butter flour and that one says don't press red button all good advice okay now I'll show you a little bit about the resource scanning system here we have a, uh, a resource probe with the two different orbital scanners we're in a polar orbit around Duna you have to put yourself in a polar orbit to use this M700 survey scanner so let's just uh, activate it perform orbital survey now it's uploading the data with our communitron and it's complete so we should now have a resource map of Duna. If we go to our map view here we can see this sort of scan line style but we don't have to look at it like that in our resource panel which is here on the right you can adjust the cutoff so you can show say only where the current concentration of ore is 40% or higher. You can also change the color. And also the style, which can be lines, dots, or uh, just your sort of standard colors. So there's lots of ways to display this. So you can pick something that contrast the planet so it's easy to see or just on your personal taste personally I like pink so let's go back to our probe now with this uh, narrowband scanner if we activate it it'll start rotating it'll show us the biome we're over as well as the latitude and longitude and you can see here the um, concentration of ore on the point on the surface we are over. We can activate the GUI and uh, if right now the only resource available is ore but uh, others could be added in mods or could be added in future patches and so this button would be to switch between the resources. Again there's a option to change the color of the overlay and uh, the refresh button just takes a snapshot of whatever you're over at the moment so you got your big antenna scans the whole planet and then you use this little one for narrowing it down to find uh, the perfect location for your mining operations now I also have a rover on Duna here so our rover is equipped with uh, the surface scanning module that I mentioned earlier. So this will tell us our latitude and longitude and our biome. And you can see that uh, we're currently over an area with 5% uh, ore. So that's a even finer tool to really narrow down your spot where you want your uh, your resource extraction operations to set up.
Now I'm going to demonstrate a few different things with this asteroid mining and research ship I have here. If we just zoom in on the ship itself, you can see I've got some drills, the ISRU converter, an ore tank, and also a mobile processing lab. So first we're going to look at the resource extraction. We can deploy our drills. And then once they are deployed, we can start asteroid harvest. And they begin chewing away at the asteroid. You can see they have an overheat level and a load status. So if the heat gets too high, this load will scale back to compensate. Um, there are various ways of dissip dissipating heat. The best way is to use solar panels, which now double as radiators. These uh, nuclear engines are also uh, much hotter than previous, so you'll need to manage the heat coming off them carefully. Uh, they also no longer have their gimbal, so you make some trade-offs for the efficiency with the nuclear engine now. Okay, so with our ore tank, you can see we're gathering ore quite quickly from the asteroid. So we can start up our converter. We're, I've already topped up our liquid fuel for our uh, nuclear engines. We could use a little more monopropellant, so I'm going to start this making monopropellant. You can see it's got a nice little animation, little pistons and gears working. And our monopropellant tanks are filling up slowly. Now the nice thing with the resource mining is that it will continue even in the background when you don't have the vessel active. So if you start a large-scale mining operation, you can just leave it to do its thing. Okay, let's disengage these for now. Now we're going to look at the new science uh, lab mechanics. So the science lab works quite a bit differently than it did previous. What it does is it acts as a uh, persistent science generator once you put some data in it to be analyzed. This system is completely separate from the regular means of transmitting or returning data to Kerbin. Uh, so any experiment that you load into the lab to be processed can also be taken back to Kerbin and then you can get the science in both ways. Also the science lab is no longer uh, able to reset materials bay and mystery goo containers. That's now the job of scientist Kerbals. So let's get uh, Bob or yes Bob out here. He is uh, one of our scientists in our lab. So we can observe our materials bay. Keep the data. Uh, and collect the data from it. Now it gives us this warning that uh, removing the data will render it inoperable and restoring the functionality require a scientist. We'll remove it and since Bob is a scientist we can restore it and then it can be reused. Now let's go up to this uh, service bay where we have some additional experiments. Oops. So let's uh, observe the mystery goo. You notice this button here to process in the lab module. So we'll send that over to the lab. There's a progress bar here while it's uh, processing. Uh, neither of those will work, but we can get some gravity data. Send that to the lab as well. I didn't have this option with the uh, materials bay because I've already put that data into the lab. Each uh, experiment, an experiment being an instrument in a specific biome in a specific situation, can only be put into the lab once. Um, but each lab is considered 
uh, its own thing. So if you have three labs, you can put the experiment in in each of them. You also get more um, more science, or I should probably say faster science, because I think the conversion rate is always the same. But you get the science faster if the lab is on the ground rather than in orbit, except for Kerbin, because obviously that would make it way too easy. Uh, you also get more for using the lab in uh, the same region where the data comes from. And the better the experience of your scientists manning the lab, the faster your conversion will be as well. So let's board. Okay, so you can see here, right now it's uh, researching the small amount that I put in there earlier. You can put up to 500 data in the lab. Right now I only have 3.9. Um, and the more you have in here, the faster the rate will be. So it's beneficial to have the lab as topped up as you can have it at all times. On the topic of recovery, uh, the actual science generated by the lab must be transmitted. You can't get the science by returning the lab to Kerbin and recovering it. So just keep that in mind. Anyway, we can start this research and getting not a huge amount, only 0.02 science per day. But if we had a lot more data in here, this would be quite a bit faster. But if we speed up time, see our amount of data is decreasing as it's being converted into science. And I believe the conversion rate is five science for every one data. Last thing to note about this asteroid is that we aren't actually near Kerbin. If we look uh, over here, this planet here is Drez. Because Drez now can spawn asteroids around it. They won't start to appear until you enter Drez's SOI for the first time. Um, and they sort of form an asteroid field around Drez. Not a proper belt because they don't go all the way around its orbit. They're more or less orbiting Drez itself. But it makes Drez sort of a Ceres analog with many smaller bodies around it and makes it a somewhat more interesting place to visit. Now we are going to look at the new re-entry heating effects. So we are on a re-entry trajectory back to Kerbin here with the uh, Valentina in Mark 1 command pod with just a heat shield and a parachute. It's just going to speed up a bit until we start to see some effects. Now I do not have stability assist on right now. And uh, with the old aerodynamic system, or with Ferrum Aerospace Research and Deadly Reentry, uh, you used to get the capsule would be stable base first into the airstream. Now with the uh, new aerodynamics and the heat shields, it seems to kind of want to tip into the airstream not quite all the way over. And if you put anything over the, uh, the top of the pod, like if you had experiments up here or something, uh, I've heard reports that you could have your f capsule flip all the way around. Um, part of this is due to the issue with the heat shields I spoke about earlier. Um, we'll see if that gets fixed in a patch. Uh, and as I mentioned that there are config edits or module manager scripts available now to help with that issue. Uh, but let's watch what happens with uh, the new stock model. So let's accelerate until we start to see some effects. There we go. So right now, we have the capsules tipping somewhat downwards. Now, it seems to be stable 
in whatever kind of direction you put it in. So we can also align that to the top or to the side. And we often find our parachute might explode if we have it slipping into the stream like that. So we're going to put stability assist on so we can actually get our base first. You just want to be careful that you don't uh, run out of electric charge with your um, uh, stability assist on because you only have a limited amount with just the pod and no way of replenishing it. You can see that our heat shield is bright orange now. Any part that is hot will start to glow like that. You can right click on it to see uh, our ablative material depleting off the heat shield. We've got quite a generous amount in uh, in the heat shield, so this should be good for returns from the moon as well as uh, from low orbit. Also, you'll find it takes much longer to slow all the way down than it did in previous versions. Uh, this is due to the new aer aerodynamic system and the fact that the lower atmosphere is far less soupy than it was previously. We deploy our parachute, and that sends our g-forces way up, and we slow down from a thousand meters per second to almost nothing in just a few seconds. So the parachutes are quite powerful and quite strong as well in the new aerodynamic system. One more thing we can look at while we're heading down under time warp is that the stock parachutes now open more gradually. So even at four times time acceleration, the parachutes won't rip your craft apart. And now we're going to talk about the new aerodynamic system. I'm on the runway here with the uh, stock Aris 3A. I've just replaced the uh, basic jet engine with the turbo ramjet. A little more thrust to play with. Let's just take off. Now as I discussed when we were talking about the re-entry effects, it's now possible to go much faster in the lower atmosphere. So fast, in fact, that with this powerful engine and a small aircraft like this, uh, you can easily start ripping parts off your plane and also losing bits to thermal, uh, or compression heating, rather. So let's throttle down so that does not happen. Uh, mock effects are now simulated as well, so you may find your planes handle differently once they are through the sound barrier. The system is still somewhat more forgiving than uh, Ferrum Aerospace Research is. The drag is now calculated based on your um, cross-sectional area from the front rather than just per part uh, as with the old system. So parts will occlude parts behind them from the airstream. Interestingly, if you radially attach a part and then recess it in using the translate tool, that will not occlude the part. They have to be stuck on with the stack nodes uh, in order to occlude properly. Some things that are not uh, that are also not simulated is that uh, wing sweep does not really have a difference, uh, um, make a difference in the maximum speed that is attainable. So this aircraft would go just as fast with straight wings as it does with these delta wings. If you can hear, there's now atmospheric effects that are actually always kind of present, but you especially know them when you uh, pull high g-forces. You can also now stall wings, which was not the case before. 
And uh, let's just push this thing to the limit to see what will happen. Coming up on 1000 meters per second, we can see if we can get the compression heating. And our control surfaces are burning off. And everything is exploding. Yes. Let's just finish off with a few uh, miscellaneous items of convenience and also some eye candy. So let's start off with uh, looking at this Kerbal X on the launch pad. And if we look uh, down while we launch, you can see we have these nice flame trench effects shooting exhaust to either side of the launch pad. We also have uh, landing effects, or I guess also takeoff effects for landers. Anytime you are near a surface and firing your engine, you'll get these uh, exhaust reflection and dust effects. Also on the uh, Space Center screen, there's now a button to warp to the next morning. And finally, there's now a button on your orbit to be able to warp to your next maneuver node. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed my overview of Kerbal Space Program 1.0, and I hope you will be joining me wh when I continue my Kerbal Commonwealth Space Agency series. This has been Promi, thanks for watching.